Welcome back to Off the Ball Saturday here on News Talk. John Duggan with you through to five. On Thursday, the legendary BBC football commentator John Motson died. He was 77. For so many of us in the Republic of Ireland who had the BBC or watched Match of the Day, once Colour TV became ubiquitous, John Motson was the voice of football. His career spanned 50 years on the BBC from 1968 to 2018, and in recent years, he worked for Talk Sport Radio. On the BBC, he joined the Match of the Day team in 1971. He commentated on 10 World Cups, 10 years. European Championships and 29 FA Cup Finals. We put a bit of a tribute together to John. You'll hear a part of an interview he did with Jack Ken Mayer from Sport Bible on the importance of football to society following a flavour of some of his best moments behind the mic over so many years. Joining us on the line now to talk about John is his former BBC colleague, friend and ex-Republic of Ireland and Liverpool defender Mark Lawrence. And Mark, good afternoon. Good afternoon, John. When you were playing for Liverpool in the 1980s, uh, Mark, um, were commentators such as John on your radar, as it were? Yes, most definitely. Um, because if, if you knew John, his, his attention to detail in terms of commentary was, was just amazing. He would have most, if not all, managers' numbers and he would um, ring them on the Friday and ask them the team. And there was such a trust between, such a bond between them all that it, he would have the team with, obviously, the fact that he couldn't give it away to anybody. So it allowed him to prepare on the Friday, his commentary. Um, his wife used to help him. Annie, she was part and boss. It was like a, a duo. And he'd just make all his notes on an A4 sheet of paper all ready for the game the next day. And then, actually, so say he came to Anfield to do our game, he would be there ridiculously early for three o'clock, like half past 11 or something, and he'd speak to everybody He'd double check that the teams were still the same. And if he happened to see you and he knew you'd come up and have a little chat, he would obviously tell you some stuff like, you know, if you if you're actually playing today, we said, which it looks like you are, this will be a 76 game for Liverpool, all those kind of things. And we just we just got to know him. He was and also, again in those days, which were completely different, John Motson and people like Barry Davis, um, they would go in the in the boardroom after the match. They would be invited into the boardroom by obviously the, the, the club at, at Liverpool, and they made fantastic connections with everybody. These were big figures, Mark, because there was less television back then. There was less channels, mm-hmm. um, so more people were sitting down to watch match of the day or watch a, a game that was live. So you had to be suitable. You had to be acceptable. You had to be liked. Yes, m- m- most definitely, and. Um, I think as well w- with that, and, and Motti will always tell you that, obviously, for match of the day, um, the programme went on live, but obviously it wasn't the whole game. So it was, it was highlighted as, as much as anything. But that doesn't make any difference to commentators because you've still got to commentate and you've got to get it right. So, And lots of people seem to think that, that you know, people, commentators went to the game and then they did the commentary over over the videos that they were saying seeing after the game had finished and people wouldn't believe you but no it's it's what they do they're actually up there on the gantry what wind rain hail snow and and get on with it and you know they were i mean himself and barry davis were, were obviously the, the two main uh guys with, with with bbc and they sort of they wouldn't be the best of friends but they were you know they both knew that one of them was always eventually going to be John and it, and it turned out that it was John. But Barry was compensated by the fact that he, he could do tennis, he could do all kinds of other sports as well, but they were top commentators. What do you think made John Martin such a great commentator, Mark? I would say that in all my time with him, John, um, we've done World Cup finals, Euros, Golden Goal Euros as well, uh, FA Cup finals, etc. He's always got the big moments right absolutely perfect and you know he'll, he'll have he'll know at the end of the uh, end of the game exactly what he's going to say because he will have he'll, he'll have wrote many different endings um and he was just and listen it's just that 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 thing about he had to know absolutely everything but also he, he enjoyed the game when it was on and um you know, we had we had a lot of fun, really. In all honesty, I mean, he'd, he'd had Sir Trevor Brooking with him co-commentating for a while, and Trevor um, relinquished the task. And then Graham Lasso was was due to take it, and for some reason, he decided not to. So I got the shout, and I said to our boss Niall Sloan, 
I said, look, now, I said, I'll do it with pleasure. I said, the only problem is, of course, you know, I've played Friday. And he said, no, it, it, it won't be a problem. And it, and it turned out that it, it wasn't a problem. But um, God love Motti because I just remember one day and he turned around to me and we'd, we'd done a commentary and he said, I need to thank you. And I said, what for? He said, you've given me an extra 10 years in terms of commentating because I was just, I think I was just a bit different and I like to have a little bit of a laugh about it as well. It was supposed to be entertainment. So um, I'll never forever ever forget that day and he had a little bit of a tear in his eye now i'm also almost bubbling as well thinking oh my goodness yeah a pro- proper proper bloke but the other thing as well he would you'd have a drink with him afterwards you know even if like me as a co-commentator had made mistakes or whatever it wasn't mentioned you just got on with life and very very generous person every christmas we'd have a lunch for 32 of us himself included in mayfair so in london and he would pay for all of it and by the way, the lunch wasn't two hours, it was six or seven hours. And um, that's why you, you, you've seen that, you know, in all the newspapers they across here as well, they've done massive pieces about him because he's just a generous guy. But also, for many of us, and me included, he was the voice of football, quite simply. Yeah, and a kind soul, as you say, Laro. So mm. how did it kind of develop between the first game you did with him in the box to work in a World Cup finals you learn the rhythms you learn when to talk when not to talk when to let him go because he was a big man for the preparation oh was he ever um, you just you just you just got used to it basically we were we were, we were well you know said myself we, I thought we were really really good together I, I realised when he stopped speaking um, and I would say something and I would quite often chuck a bit of it what I thought was a funny line and he used to giggle uh, which I think he quite enjoyed. Um, and it was easy. It was easy with him. I think if you ask some some of some of the guys who work with him, as in a producer, you know, so I'll say on a match of the day on a Saturday, so the producer would turn up with, with Motti, make sure he was all right, got him a cup of coffee, all those kind of things, as I say, hours before the game. And then Motti said, right, we need to go on the gantry. So we'd go and check the gantry position. And if it wasn't right, he'd, he'd let it be known. Then he'd go back down. And basically, the poor producer just followed him around all day. And he would, you know, get him some lunch and then say, right, we need to go down the tunnel, Motti, and then take him down the tunnel. And just, it was like almost like a chaperone as much as anything. But I remember one moment, and well, a couple of moments, which were really, really funny. We were in Stuttgart for the, the World Cup in Germany. And he had a different producer, a, a, a lady, a young lady called Karen Gray. Who, she was lovely, Karen, and she was she was like, oh my goodness me! She'd heard all these stories about sometimes that, that when it's not happening for him, he, you know, he wasn't great to be around. And she was really, really worried. Well, honestly, he would, they were great together, but this time in Stuttgart, and I would turn up about two and a half hours before the match, go and say hello to him, and then just leave him, leave him to it. And eventually, I'd get up on the gantry about. Course of an hour before the game started, and, and this particular day, I think it was Stuttgart, and it was red hot. It was five o'clock in the afternoon, red hot, and and across from the main stand that we were in was a smaller stand, but the, but the sun was just above that stand. And as I came in, Karen came up to me and pulled me to one side. And she went, "He's on one." I said, "Why?" She said, "Oh my God!" He said, "You never know." Anyway, so I came and sat down, and as I sat down, he went, "Hello, Laurel, you're all right." I said, "Yeah, you're all right." He went, "No." I said, well, what's the matter, John? He said, and he, he pointed to the sun, right? He, he never moved his head. He had his notes below. He never moved his head. He pointed to the sun and he went, can you do something about that? <laughs> and I said, sorry, John, I'm leaving. I can't do anything about that. And it was it, it basically the, the sun was getting in his eyes and he's thinking to himself, I won't be able to see an important important moment in this game. But But, but it was all good. And there was another moment that I think you've recounted, Mark, where you messed up his notes. Oh yeah! Oh God, yeah! That was in the in the um, the golden goal final, which would be what um, France and it- Italy, wasn't it? Yeah. And he has this A4 piece of paper, and it's got green writing on it, black writing, red writing, and what have I missed? Blue. So he's got all his notes on there. He's got the teams, um, and it's it is a work of art. I mean, he used to sell them for 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 for, for lots of money on. In, in terms of charity, etc., and an absolute work of art. It's got the referee and a little anecdote about the referee, maybe in case he needed it, something happened, and all those kind of things. But it's all on this A4 uh, sheet of paper um, with like some cardboard backing, 
Anyway, half time in the game, not lots happening, and I just reached over to get a bottle of water. I didn't realise that the top was loose, and as I picked up the top, the whole water came out and went all over his notes. And honestly, John, he gave me this. He gave me this look, and I'm thinking, uh oh. And I'm waiting for him to say something. And Garth Trucks was the other side of Motti, and he just he could not stop laughing. <laughs> this made it made it even worse. And I, and I thought. I'm, I'm going to have to say something. So I said, look, John, I'm really, really sorry. I said, but think about it. I said, you, you know absolutely everything on there. And he just looked at me. And we didn't speak for a couple of minutes. And then just as we are coming back to start again, he went, yeah, all good, all good. So, yeah, I destroyed his notes. How, how dare me. Was there a moment when you said to yourself, sitting beside him, wow, he really got this. He really nailed this call. Like some of the best calls that he made, Laurel. Yeah, what was it? What was the uh, the Liverpool Arsenal final in the Michael uh, Owen two thousand one? Was it? Yeah, yeah, unbelievable, absolutely unbelievable. He got it, and he, the great thing about him as well, John, was that when it happened, he just waited. I mean, he didn't wait for long, but it's like just a couple of seconds, and he was obviously getting programmed in his mind because he knew exactly what he was going to say because he had everything worked out, and and then he'd hit you with with obviously what he wanted to say, and he was. He was just, he was just brilliant, um, but he was he, he, he was different. I mean, <clears throat> excuse me. When I my, after I did my first um, co com with him, uh, Niall Sloan, as I mentioned before, he was our boss, and he said, "Oh, that was really really good." And I said, "Was it?" He, he said, "Yeah, yeah." I said, "Niall," I said, "I can tell you this, but probably not him." I said, "It was like working with Rain Man," and he just started <laughs> laughing. <laughs> And, and, he, and he went, well, no one's ever said that before. I said, but it is, isn't it? And he went, absolutely, totally true. And it, and it, and it was because he had to, everything had to be just so. Because, as I say, attention to detail. And he was just a perfectionist. Uh, but still able to convey that boyish enthusiasm uh, and that reflection of what the fan felt and not go over the top on his commentaries, not scream and shout, um, just no. generally just called it as it was. No kind of idiosyncrasies or no um, prepared lines. I know the Crazy Gang Culture Club, is, but I'd say that probably came into the top of his mind, you know, given yes, the way I, yes. I looked at a lot of his commentaries. Um, yeah. Just in terms of his views on the game, because obviously we know he commentated on the game for 50 years, but was he a fan of expansive football? Did he like the art of defending? Did he talk about much about the game itself? Oh, yeah. He talked about the game. And the thing is, of course, he knew every he knew every player. I mean, I, I know, and, and I've been with him when he's had calls from, from guys at different teams asking about players. Had he seen them? You know, and, and what were they like? And all those kind of things. Yeah, so, but he, no, he, just, he just loved, like that Liverpool game, he, he loved it because it was just proper football, as I would say, and 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 the France Italy golden goal game as well. I mean, if you think about that as well, you know, for a man who who does worry about ev- everything and did worry about everything, so all of a sudden, you know, it's a golden goal, and no one's ever had it before. And he's he's what you imagine his mind, the way he works, and he's thinking, oh my goodness, what if I get this wrong? And he, I mean, Trezor Gay scored, didn't he? And he got it absolutely. Absolutely perfect. So, um, but he was, I mean, he had his idiosyncrasies and myself and Ray Stubbs used to look after him. <coughs> Excuse me. We used to look after him before games, uh, certainly when we were away and we would, he'd always like, he'd, he'd like to eat. So say it was an eight o'clock kickoff, he'd like to eat at four and he said to him, what do you want? And he said, I want a cheese toasty, which <laughs> if you're in <laughs> Austria or Switzerland at the time would not be the easiest thing to get. And then I remember one day we, re- we really put him out of kilter because we said, and we were in, a, it was in Austria, in Vienna, and we were going to the match to commentate. And we said, uh, we're going on the train. And like he stopped and he went, why? So he said, well, I said, I said Stubbs has done the dummy run um, to see exactly, you know, where we get on, where we got off, all those kind of things. And it's just going to be so much easier, John, because instead of taking an hour and a half because of all the traffic, it's going to take us 20 minutes. And he looked at us and he just so wasn't certain. Anyway, we got him on the train. And, of course, then after the match, he's telling everyone, oh, I got on with the lads and I went on the train. I never would have ever thought about that before. Just honestly, mad, mad. Yeah, and wedded to routine, obviously. He needed to have his routine so he can get in yes. his mind how to nail the commentary. And he never made a mistake, as he said. He listened back to all the commentaries, all the goals, didn't make any mistakes. So hard, such a hard craft. Also, on a serious note, he was there at Hillsborough, Mark, and... 
you know, even mm. when the Leppings Lane was being overcrowded and the curse was happening and that tragedy was unfolding, you know, he was describing everything correctly. And you need someone like that who's trusted to be able to tell you what's going on. Oh, absolutely. Because, I mean, they, they were on air for ages. And, you know, obviously as everything was, was, was unfolding and the realisation of, of what was happening, and but also the fact that he, he's, he's got to, I don't know whether commentate on it was right or he has to talk about it because it's, you know, the pictures were still there and absolutely everything. And I think that's, that's when you realise that you're actually working with somebody who's absolutely, totally on top of their job and and that's the way that he was, you know, extremely sympathetic, and you know it was just part and part and parcel of of the, of the way that it was. And, and here's one for you, John. So <clears throat> we were doing uh, it was football focus many years ago, and Tony Blair had agreed. Well, in fact, he didn't, he didn't agree to come in. He, he'd spoken to someone and asked, could he come on football focus? Because okay. himself and his eldest son, I think his name's Blair, if I, my memory serves me right, they used to watch it used to watch Football Focus together on a Saturday, generally, and the Prime Minister. He said, that's what our kind of hour together. So, of course, we said, yeah, of course you can come in and all those kinds. So there's a bit of a, you know, a hoopla about security and all those kind of things. <clears throat> anyway, <clears throat> excuse me. Anyway, he turned up and in the room, in the green room, was Hanson, Lineker, me, um, and the presenter who was, um, I think, a machine. And... He walked in, right, and he went straight, Motti was there, and he, the Prime Minister walked straight to Motti and said, hello, Motti. <laughs> now, w- where would you get that? There I mean, you he, go. he obviously completely blacked us, or blanked us, but uh, he went straight to Motti. This is the Prime Minister of the country. Hello, Motti. So that tells you something about him. Well, there you go. You're known by your, your, you know, your moniker, as it were. Um, mm. obviously, you're known across the nation by the most important person at the time in, in terms of politics in the in the nation. Obviously, he knew Cluffy. He know he knew Fergie. He had his almost his run-ins as well with them, which are well documented. Uh, yeah, I mean, he, I know, I know, and it was it was never ever um, published. This so Roy Keane got sent off at Old Trafford. Wouldn't know who against, and Motty's got Fergie. And he's hitting with him. Roy Keane got sent off again. Um, and basically, Fergie was effing and everything to Motti, right? And it really, really, really gave it to him. And there's a bit of anti-BT and uh, BBC in there as well and everything. So anyway, so basically, the the interview was a shambles. But down the line in London, um, Des Lynham, who was watching, because Des presented the programme in those days, Des said to our editor, he said, you should show that. You should show that because that's somebody bullying, you know. It's, and obviously, Fergie was just completely mad. I, I think they, they might have even been beaten at home on the day, and we we declined, we declined to show it. But but you know, I mean, all after that, the aftermath was that every time then that that Motti interviewed Fergie, it was all sweetness and light, wasn't it? Yeah. But uh, Fergie, Fergie really let rip. Not so much the fact that it was Motti and the BBC, but the fact that, you know, Roy Keane had got sent off again for such a great player and it was like another suspension for him. And as I say, they possibly might have even lost the game that day. And you're travelling the world, you're covering World Cup finals. Like, this is the pinnacle of um, the industry. <laughs> Obviously, you were a player, Mark. You played for us, you played mm. for Ireland, you played for Liverpool, you won all those leagues in the European Cup. But in a different way, you're reaching the top of the world in another way. You're like you're in a press box at a World Cup final with all the people from Argentina, Brazil, all over the world covering the biggest game. Yeah, fab. <clears throat> I used to keep pinching myself. And, you know, it was, it, was, um, it was good on a day off as well because we'd always go, we'd go out and have lunch. Um, he enjoyed he enjoyed his life. Um, he always had as well, John. And I'm not speaking out of turn here. His his, his last drink of the day would have been scotch. Yeah. And sometimes, t- sometimes as well, Irish Jamesons. I would have thought. And that was always thing. So he'd go. We'd be in a hotel with other people, obviously, because um, obviously there was like it was over a hundred people there. If you if you're in the World Cup, wherever it is, from the BBC, and he'd say, right, last drink, then I'm going to bed. And he'd have a scotch. He'd have had his cheese toasty before, and and he would and he would go to bed. And he'd be up bright and early in the morning. And he just knew that he'd, he'd already prepped for the for, for the next game. Um, I do remember as well in, in in Switzerland, where unusually, 
just the two of us were traveling. We normally, as I said, had a producer, had a, had a sound man, engineer, all those kind of things where there's probably six or seven, but it was only himself and myself. So we we're in the hotel. The car comes to pick us up and, you know, I wheel his case out for him, as you do, chuck it in the boot and all those kind of things, get to the airport, get his case out again, obviously with mine, and go in to check in. Now, in Switzerland, in those years, you could actually go to a machine and check yourself in. You didn't have to speak to anybody. So he said, oh, Laura, why don't we do that? And I said, John, honestly, I'm Mr. Bean with all this stuff. I'm absolutely hopeless, but we'll have a go. Anyway. God, God love him, I, I sorted it all out and managed to get the tags on and absolutely everything. And then you took you took your suitcase over to the to the guy who, who just checked it. And he went, yeah, all good, all good, off you go, and, you know, go through. So fine. So we do security and he wasn't a good traveller, wasn't a good traveller at all, but quite nervous. And we go through security and fortunately, you know, we had this pass. So we went straight into the lounge. And he said, right, Laurel, what are you having to drink? And I said, I'm all right, John, actually. I'm, I'm, I'm fine. I don't, re- I don't really want one. I'm, I'll have one after the game, whatever. He said, well, you know I'm going to have one. Don't you? He said, yeah, yeah. He said, well, have I told you that I've changed what I'm going to drink? And I went, no. <laughs> he said, yeah. He said, uh, I had a vodka the other week by mistake. And he said, I quite like vodka. So he went, can you go and get me one? So obviously I was, I was in his book, wasn't he? Going go and get a drink and everything and a sandwich. And But it was... It was it was just yeah. fun, and it was like I don't know, it was a bit like your uncle. Sure, sure. In charge, in charge of you, where, where yes. there was obviously leeway, but he was still your uncle, and you know you couldn't sort of misbehave in case you went yeah. and told your parents. Uh, just to finish, Mark, we're sorry to for the loss of your friend and your colleague uh, John Matson. Uh, he's going to be remembered as a one-off and and the voice of the game. Oh well, yesterday, John, honestly, my phone never ever ever stopped from all different people. And everybody, you know, everybody knows the stories, but, but literally millions of people, men and women, right, were, were brought up with listening to his voice and, and what a voice he had. And by the way, what a top commentator and person he was. Mark Lawrence, and thank you so much for being on Off the Ball to share your memories of John Matson today.